I was definitely not enthralled by what I've played of Pokemon. Like I said in my review of Pokemon Shield, the general gameplay is lazily stagnant and refuses to do a whole lot new, even after 20 plus years. I like the idea, I think the potential is there, but Nintendo has gotten so complacent that we're sure as hell not going to get a decent game out of them. So instead, there's this game called Cassette Beast that's a total ripoff of Pokemon, and it doesn't even try to hide it. Full disclosure, I did receive this game for free from the publisher for the purpose of doing a review, and for once, I actually think it's a straight up good game. It's not often that I get a free game to review and I find it to be decent. All I can say is that my opinions are my own and have not been influenced in any way, but you only have my word to go off of, so take it or leave it. The story of Cassette Beast has the player stranded on a mysterious island called New World, and it's swarming with monsters. A nearby town has been established in which a community has come together to survive, but everyone's completely given up on trying to escape. It turns out that New World is actually sucking people in from different timelines and even alternate universes. But while many enter against their will, it seems impossible to leave the island, let alone the planet, or the current dimension, or what have you. That is, until a fateful encounter with a particularly powerful monster known as an Archangel hints at the possibility of freedom. Now the player and a ragtag bunch of adventurers must explore the island, find the remaining Archangels, and uncover the mystery behind New World. The story is kind of... I don't know, it's whatever. Like, compared to Pokemon, it's a masterpiece, but the competition is hardly fair, right? On its own merits, the story here is kind of just okay. It has a lot of neat ideas that do get explored a little bit, and in interesting ways. The coalescence of alternate realities, cultural concepts adopting a physical form, and it's always fun to deal with eldritch horrors beyond human understanding. If you've played the recent video game Control, well, Cassette Beast, surprisingly enough, leans in that direction. The writing can be a little bit adult at times, or at least young adult. I certainly wouldn't recommend this for kids, put it that way. Some of the concepts are a little heady, ranging from the philosophical to just hating on mundane life. Very teenager kind of stuff. There's even a dating aspect to the game. You can get in a romantic relationship with one of the main party members, which has a couple of small cutscenes, and it alters the ending very slightly. It feels kind of unnecessary to me, I'm usually not one to take the idea of self-inserting myself into a game too seriously, but they did a good job at making sure it doesn't get in the way, and I guess it's kind of cute, so I'm fine with it. The general world and lore is pretty cool, and I enjoyed it a fair bit. The problem is that there's not much of an actual plot here. You get a collection of side stories focused on each of the individual main characters, and there's a massive plot dump right at the beginning, smack dab in the middle, and at the very end. But aside from that, there's not a whole lot happening throughout the entire game. There is some fun dialogue here and there, maybe more than just some, the writing's not terrible, but it isn't anything amazing either. The side stories don't add up to a whole lot, and the plot dumps for the major overarching story are way too few and far between. Part of this is due to the game's non-linear progression, which I'll get into later, but that doesn't change the flaw as it is. While they have made a pretty cool setting here, with almost halfway decent characters, there still isn't much of a story being told, or at the very least, one with a reasonable pacing. That being said, the rest of the presentation is very nice. They're clearly going for an Octopath Traveler kind of look, combining 2D pixel art in a 3D world, and they've pulled it off quite well. Sometimes the camera angle isn't the greatest, and in the developer's infinite wisdom, they've decided that violently swinging the camera around is a good solution. 
It's really not so bad, but two steps forward and one step back is going to be a theme with this one. Now, as for the music, it's really good. And I don't want to overuse the word surprising, but I was not expecting this game to have so many vocal tracks, and they're all pretty nice. I found myself singing along to the theme of the cafe pretty often, and you're going to go to this cafe a lot, so you better learn to love this song. Each individual area in the overworld has its own distinct instrumental theme, although the boundaries between areas can be narrow, which can have a song abruptly cut itself off. Battle themes and turn-based RPGs are important because you don't want to get tired of hearing the same song over and over again. Unfortunately, there's not much of a selection in this game. To be fair, there are unique songs for all the different types of mini-bosses, totaling to about five separate battle themes throughout the game, not even counting the final boss. However, you'll listen to the regular battle theme a thousand times over by the time you reach the credits. Thankfully, all the songs are really good, and I never got tired of hearing any of them. I would have liked to hear more variety in the battle songs, but what is there is still really great. And if the vocals do annoy you, you have the option to turn them off too. As for a Pokemon ripoff, I feel like it's important to discuss the monster designs. Now, I'll be frank, I'm one of those people who sits firmly in the camp that the first generation of Pokemon had the best designs. For my money, nothing's gonna top Blastoise, Vileplume, or Parasect. Although a couple of the designs in Pokemon Shield were okay. Anyway, for Cassette Beast, I absolutely love most of these guys. Some do come off as a little bit bland, like this Kung Fu Moth or a generic Japanese spirit, but I still think they look pretty cool. I definitely like Cassette Beast's version of a garbage monster way more than Pokemon's. This one here is so cool. It's a wooden training dummy that evolves into a Ronin with a large straw hat, and he uses a bullseye target for a shield. Most of the names are meant to be stupid puns, like Ban Sheep being a Banshee ghost modeled after a sheep. The Scavangelist is supposed to be a skeleton priest modeled after a bishop chess piece, and one of the best ones is a bartender spirit perfectly named Gin and Tonic. I love these descriptions too. It isn't entirely clear what kind of drinks they serve, only that they are family friendly and not affecting the age rating of the game. Very funny. My favorite is definitely Fountess, a depressed rich lady with a giant shower head for a fancy hat whose constant tears power her attacks. I love her attack animation, it's so great. I could go on and on, a lot of these are really good, like Flapwoods or Sands of Time, but you get the idea. A lot of thought and care went into these designs and I think they did a really good job, and the pixel art is great too. Despite a few missteps, mainly with the overall lack of music variety, questionable camera stuff, and how off the story's pacing is, the presentation is still pretty good. But moving on to what really matters. As I said before, the gameplay is ripping off Pokemon wholesale, 
and it's not even shy about it. Like, you don't capture Pokemon in Pokeballs, you record monsters using cassette tapes. I'd say that's kind of weird, but it's not like Pokemon was ever normal anyway. Just like in Pokemon, both sides take turns selecting their commands, and the monster with the higher speed goes first, exchanging blows until one side goes down. Even the stat distribution is extremely similar to Pokemon. The only real differences are that instead of attack and special attack, Cassette Beast uses melee attack and ranged attack. Elemental properties are here too, like how water beats fire, fire beats plant, and plant beats water. But I'll get more into that later because there is a lot to unpack. So, what makes me like this game so much more than Pokemon, to the point that I actually found myself having a good time? Despite the numerous similarities, Cassette Beast is clearly going out of its way to take the formula in a different and much better direction. First off, your monsters aren't limited to an embarrassingly small four moves. Like, that limitation made sense on the Game Boy, but the fact that you're still doing that over 25 years later is ridiculous. In Cassette Beast, each monster maxes out at 8 slots for abilities, so you have a lot more room to work with. You don't have power points either, which were essentially really limited ammunition for a Pokemon's different attacks. Cassette Beast uses action points, which is essentially a stamina bar. You start every battle with 2 action points, and your cheapest move will cost you 0. You can either spam your medium damage attacks, or save up a couple of turns for a stronger one, depending on the situation. This can elongate battles a little bit, but it's a lot better than in Pokemon where you typically focus on using your strongest attacks every turn. All of this alone is already enough to put the combat a step above, but one of the biggest differences is that the vast majority of the game has battles being 2 versus 2 as opposed to Pokemon's 1 vs. 1, and this makes a massive difference. This makes all the fights so much more dynamic and less boring. Alright, check this out. I'm about to blow your mind with this one. Cassette Beast includes an in-game, elemental-type chart that's included for free right at the start. Incredible. For that matter, each monster's elemental type is also displayed clearly during battle, and a tooltip advises you on how a specific move will interact at a given time. All of these were specific complaints I stated in my Pokemon Shield review, and it's such a relief to see it in action and actually done well. You might notice in this chart that none of these attacks are strictly based on damage, there's no super effective considerations to take here. Instead, certain interactions will inflict different status effects. For example, Wind will blow away fire monsters, reducing their attack power for the next few turns, while Metal Attacks will pierce Earth monsters like a shovel, lowering their defense. Some of this stuff gets pretty creative. If a Metal Attack hits an electric monster, then that monster will become more conductive, increasing their accuracy and making single target attacks hit multiple enemies. On the other hand, plastic has the opposite effect, reducing an electrical monster's conductivity, lowering their accuracy, and making multi-target attacks hit only singular enemies. Fire can melt an ice enemy, temporarily turning it into a water type, which itself will douse a Fire-type's flames and reduce its attack power. Fire can also melt plastic monsters, which alters their chemical properties and temporarily turns it into a Poison-type. And Poison gases are flammable and more susceptible to burning. If a Metal attack hits a Glass monster, then Glass shards will spread across the battlefield, damaging any opponents who use melee attacks from then on. There are so many creative and unique matchups, and because it's not strictly damage based, there's nothing stopping you from using a weaker type as long as you can deal with the negative consequences. Although, it is rarely worth it in that sense, and utilizing the type matchups appropriately still helps a ton. 
It is worth noting that every monster is only a single element, which probably oversimplifies the game a bit too much, and they clearly did this in support of the fusion mechanic. Any two monsters in the game can be temporarily fused together for that battle, combining their elemental types, combining their stats, and even merging their move lists into a giant list of 16 commands. And certain fusions even gain access to a unique super move. You'll lose out on inputting two commands per turn since now you're only working with a single monster, but it hardly matters because the stats of fused monsters are so far and away more powerful that it is completely broken. It's really annoying how unbalanced this is. Trying to beat a boss without fusing can be nearly impossible, while beating a boss with one or two fusions makes it significantly easier. I don't think the mechanic is all that necessary or adds a whole lot to the game, which is kind of a shame because the developers really went out of their way to implement it as a major part of the story, and they did reasonably well with that aspect. It's just that, for gameplay reasons, it's pretty dumb. The way the game handles buffs and debuffs in battle is also quite different from Pokemon. Instead of stacking the buffs and debuffs until they reach an upper limit, Cassette Beast simply applies a set percentage. These status effects can still be stacked, but it only affects the number of turns that that status effect will remain applied, as opposed to how powerful it is. I like this system so much more, mainly because it's a lot easier to keep track of than in Pokemon, where the stat changes felt like they were being arbitrarily hidden. What's also really strange is that the buffs and debuffs, as well as the action points, aren't just stuck to a single monster. They'll transfer to the next monster you switch to, whether it's voluntarily or via knockout. Status effects are applied more so to your trainer, not necessarily to the monster directly, so both good and bad effects will transfer to the next upcoming monster. It's an interesting way to do things. You can save up your action points for a different monster in your party and unleash their really powerful attacks when you're ready. Or you can take a whole bunch of negative status effects and then swap them to a monster with really high defense or maybe one that is able to cure itself. It's a level of strategy that is simply not present in Pokemon. And while Cassent Beast is hardly the deepest game out there, it's certainly deep enough that I had a good time exploring its combat system, which I can't really say the same about for Pokemon. Another one of my favorite quality of life improvements is the way that leveling and evolutions work. Your main character and your different partners are where the bulk of your experience points go, and what determines your main stats in battle. As for the individual monsters, they all max out at level 5. Once you reach that point, you can choose to evolve them into a higher form, if such is available, and if not, reaching level 5 is still worth it for the maximum stat gains and new abilities you'll unlock. While evolutions do appear straightforward for the most part, there are some weird inconsistencies that aren't directly explained and I had to look it up online while writing this review. This can include the time of day that they evolve or if they have a certain ability currently equipped. You can get a different evolution and not understand how or why. I don't really get the purpose. Most of the time you're directly given a choice on which evolutionary path you want to take, but then sometimes it just arbitrarily forces it upon you. Regardless, it's thankfully a hell of a lot less of a hassle than how Pokemon does it. You don't have to waste hours of your life leveling up a Pokemon that you're not even aware doesn't have a second or third evolution, or that only evolves through some esoteric ritual. There's a lot less mystery behind this stuff in Cassette Beast, and at worst, all you have to do is level up a monster to level 5 to get the most out of it. By then, you'll have unlocked all of its moves and you'll find out if it can evolve or not. Simple as that. Speaking of leveling up and unlocking new abilities, you're able to remove all of your monster's abilities at any time and put them in storage. 
from here, you can mix and match to your heart's content. It won't mean much at first when you just start the game, but towards the end you'll have an insane amount of abilities to mess with and apply on whatever monsters you want. There are limitations, of course. Most of the time a fire monster can't learn water moves, for example. But there's a ton of stuff you can do here to really make a team feel like it's your own. It's way more expansive and freeform than what Pokemon does with its TM items. There is so much that's good about this game, and I just don't understand why Pokemon has stagnated for so long. Just play Cassette Beast. It's literally Pokemon, but not trash. That doesn't mean the game doesn't have flaws, because it does have quite a few. First off, let me get this out of the way. I'm sure the game runs fine on PC and on Xbox, but the Nintendo Switch port is just embarrassing. There are way too many load times, and sometimes they're not even consistent. You'll often get stuck at an invisible wall while you wait for the next area to load. I can't imagine the game is that demanding, I mean look at it. The open world is larger than it initially seems, but it really shouldn't be a big deal, not for a game to hang this often. You'll also definitely want to keep that autosave turned on. I had the game crash on me two or three times out of nowhere. It's rare, sure, but it should never happen. Certainly not multiple times in a single playthrough. Hell, they can't even get their company logo to play properly. This Switch port is just not good. If it's your only option, then fine, it's still perfectly playable. This is no Pathologic 2 on PlayStation 4 we're talking about here, so you don't have to worry about that. But I definitely suggest some research and considerations as to which version is the best one to buy for you. There's also a couple of major issues which seem to have leaked their way in from being inspired by Pokemon. First off, it's still pretty easy to die, so every three battles or so you'll probably have to teleport back to the cafe to heal up for free. This is pretty similar to flying to the nearest Pokemon Center, although in the case of Cassette Beast, it's much faster. However, that doesn't change the fact that going through dungeons is a meaningless chore because of this. You'll take out a couple of guards, go back to the cafe, return to the dungeon, and pick up where you left off with none of the enemies respawning. What's even the point? I feel like they might as well have implemented a system similar to RFL where you're simply restored to full health after every battle. The dungeons are also nothing to write home about. They're a hell of a lot better than in Pokemon Shield, at least, and some of them do have creative gimmicks, but for the most part, they're really nothing special. I never got around to mentioning the open world aspect, so I suppose that now is as good a time as ever. There's hardly any limiting factor in this game at all. Once you get past the tutorial, and in general, the game's opening, the entire world is basically open for you to explore. The main goal is to find the Archangels hidden throughout the island, most of which have their dungeons uncovered via a simple puzzle in the overworld, or by following one of the main character's side stories. Although, not even that bars your access to the later areas. What you're looking for in this regard are very specific monsters to capture, although the game is sure to point you in the right direction for this. After acquiring certain monsters, you unlock new ways to explore the world. And aside from this aspect, which is very easy to get through if you know what you're doing, the entire world is very open for you to traverse, and you can go through the game in any order you want. While this sounds like a neat idea in theory, this also means that there isn't a clear path of progression. Once you've beaten the game and you look back on the full map, you can get a general idea of what the developers intended, but it's still very easy to do things out of order. This leaves you both underleveled and overleveled depending on where you're at and where you're going. I guess it's not so bad, all things considered, but it's one of the reasons why I typically prefer a more curated, linear path in my games. 
If there's one thing Pokemon certainly has over Cassette Beast, it's the multiplayer aspect. Now, unfortunately, Cassette Beast doesn't have any multiplayer whatsoever. No trading monsters or versus battles. While this is something that I likely wouldn't have cared for anyway, I'm not gonna lie and say that it would have been a worthless feature. And it's also one that feels quite absent in a Pokemon ripoff. I can understand why it isn't included. This is already pretty ambitious for an indie title, but it's a shame that it's still missing. I could go on. There's the annoyance with the level differences if you're trying to level up each of the individual party members little by little, and there are some more details that I like with the battles, passive abilities, and what the game calls bootleg monsters. There is a lot to discuss in this game, but this review is already plenty long enough as is, and you've got the gist of everything by now. Basically, from my point of view, this feels like Pokemon done better, period. The foundation is there, and it's similar in a lot of ways, but they expanded upon it by increasing the number of equipable moves and making 2 vs 2 the standard throughout. They also changed the general rules enough to make Cassette Beast very much its own thing, such as the different elemental interactions, how status effects carry over to the next monster, and an overhaul on leveling, evolutions, and how equipping moves work. All of this is wrapped around a pretty good presentation too. There's a lot I like here, but the pacing is weird, to put it lightly. The fusion mechanic is both way too powerful and just kind of stupid. The progression of teleporting back and forth to heal your party for free is very stupid. Again, much of the game feels like it's two steps forward and one step back. All that being said, it's not bad. In fact, it's a pretty damn good game. If you're a fan of Pokemon, I'd encourage you to give this a shot. And for everyone else, I still think it's worth looking into if you're interested. While the game doesn't necessarily set itself up for a sequel, there's no reason why the developers can't reuse a similar setting. And I think that with the right tweaking, a successor to this has the potential to be something pretty special. Thanks for watching my review on Cassette Beast.